Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Good day and welcome to the Environmental Law Update web conference. Today's conference is being recorded and at this time I would like to turn the conference over to your host, Ms. Jennifer Bartz. Please go ahead. Thank you, Paula. Welcome everybody. I'm pleased to have you on our web conference today. In this program, we will address new leadership at the top of EPA, recent significant Clean Air Act developments. With me today are three outstanding speakers. First, we have Dick Stoll. Dick is a partner in Washington, D.C. and the Milwaukee, Wisconsin office of Foley & Lardner. He is a member of the firm's environmental regulation practice and concentrates on federal, administrative, and environmental law. Next up is Mark Timke. Mark is a partner in the firm's environmental regulation practice and energy industry team. Mark's practice encompasses all major environmental programs, including hazardous waste, Superfund, the Clean Air Act, air toxics, and wastewater. Finally, Brian Potts is a partner with the firm's environmental regulation practice, automotive, and energy industry teams. Brian has extensive experience with permitting, compliance, and litigation issues under the federal environmental laws and their various state counterparts. He is particularly focused on Clean Air Act compliance, defense work, and utility siting. Before I turn the presentation over to Dick Stoll to start things off, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com by early next week or simply download it from the files box along the right side of your screen to get a copy of the slides today. If you experience problems with Adobe Connect, please call 866-493-2825 for technology assistance. For audio assistance, dial star then zero on your telephone to reach an operator. Today's program has been set up in both a discussion and an interactive question and answer format. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Type your question into the Q&A box at the right side of the presentation slides. We will respond to written questions and also take live questions at the end of the program, time permitting. If we do not get to your questions, we'll be sure to follow up with you offline. To ensure you get the most out of today's presentation, we encourage all participants to maximize the PowerPoint to full screen usage. You can do so by clicking the full screen button located above the slides. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website by early next week. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to Jennifer Bartz, that's me, at jbartz at foley.com. Please note, those seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. A four-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Use the code to complete the form, which can be obtained in the files box, or by sending an email to me at jbartz at foley.com. And at this time, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Dick Stoll. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, we're going to... Um start talking briefly just about some of the new leadership. Uh, we've got so much substantive material to talk about that I'm going to try to cover this really fast. And we're only going to focus on three people at the top uh, who are most directly related, I think, to the Clean Air Act, since this program is going to focus on the Clean Air Act. Um, anybody who's following the news these days, even this morning, you're hearing about more and more rancor, uh, I mean, very, very acute rancor. Uh, between the Obama administration and some Republicans in Congress. Uh, I, we mentioned here that Gina McCarthy was confirmed as administrator in July. Very long and protracted process uh, which reflected the rancor. She was one of several people caught up in a major snit between some Republicans in Congress and the Obama administration, so it took forever to get her confirmed, but she finally is confirmed. When we say hitting the ground running, uh, this actually applies to the three people we're going to talk about right real quick. We've got professionals in here. We've got professionals who know what they're doing. They know the statutes. They know the programs. Gina was the assistant administrator for AIR for the last four years. And before that, she's always been an environmental professional anyway. Uh, on, you know, anybody who's followed EPA for many years, sometimes you see at the very top of the agency and, and near the top also you see, for political reasons, people coming in who maybe have never even seen a copy of the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act or something like that, they come in, some governor comes in or whatever. But 
This is definitely not the case uh, with Gina and the other two people we're going to talk about briefly. They, uh, they're environmental professionals. They've been around a long time. They know the game well. And, uh, and they also, it's, it's clear uh, for Gina and, and her, her, her replacement, they're, they're both very committed to things like climate change controls and so forth. Uh, Gina did make a speech a couple days ago and mentioned her top three, three priorities now that she's been confirmed uh, for the agency, and there they are, climate change, chemical safety. This has to do with uh, what she calls uh, a, a lot of problems with the current Toxic Substance Control Act, a lot of defects, particularly as shown up by this uh, thing that happened in West Texas uh, with the explosion and so forth. And she's also talking about uh, doing something about the aging uh, water infrastructure throughout the United States. Uh, so following up with Gina, we just have somebody who's just, just moving up, actually. Uh, Janet McCabe, she's been Gina's top deputy for the last four years when Gina was running the Air Act stuff. And Janet McCabe, again, knows the program quite well. Uh, she, for four years, she was Gina's top deputy. And even before that, she's been in the environmental regulatory game a long time. She's also a law graduate and um, well regarded uh, by everybody uh, in, in the agency uh, as somebody who's a true professional and knows, uh, knows the act and the program. But finally, we have an, the general counsel, uh, Avi Garbo, who has been at the agency for several years as deputy general counsel. Uh, and before that, uh, again, he's not new to environmental stuff at all. He was previously a staff lawyer at EPA, then he went over to DOJ, and he's actually was in a couple of D.C. law firms for a few years doing environment. So that's, uh, as relevant to the Clean Air Act, that's who the uh, top people are right now. The one other thing I wanted to say about Gina McCarthy is I think that even though she's clearly strongly committed to climate change and programs like that, um, I think most people in industry, at least who I've heard, do view her as at least <laughs> being fair and willing to listen. And when economic concerns come up and cost concerns come up, she's fair and willing to listen, uh, especially when compared to her immediate predecessor. So I guess we can go on now with uh, NSR and, and Mark. Thank you, Dick. Uh, we're going to turn to the substantive portion of the program, and we have a lot of material, as Dick mentioned, to go through. So all of us will be moving quickly through this. Uh, and again, if you have questions, uh, we can try and cover those at the end and or uh, get back to you at a later time. New source review this seems to be a topic that was uh, one that uh, I think everybody thinks was from the beginning of the Clean Air Act. It's lived with us, but actually it started maybe, oh, 14, 15 years ago in the um, end of the Clinton administration for the um, move to enforcement, and we've been living with it since. As we'll see, we finally have a lot of clarity uh, developing with respect to what we call legacy news source review. Uh, the courts are finally ruling on a lot of these cases at the appellate level, and a lot of the theories that were advanced are... Um, uh, being discussed by the courts. We'll cover some of that, uh, but I also will be covering what uh, we're seeing as the emerging area, which is the shift in the focus on enforcement, which is to the current form of new source review. And for those of you using that current form of new source review, that'd be something to watch carefully because, again, this will be an emerging area and there will be emerging law developing. Uh, with respect to the legacy area, uh, we're seeing that litigation is continuing against those who didn't settle their cases. There's a lot of settlements out there. We're seeing some Section 114, those uh, wonderful information requests that companies get, uh, tending to go to smaller facilities now, that the large facilities have been covered either in settlements or litigation, typically with a coal-fired boiler. Uh, and also we're seeing the uh, large settlements in target areas being finalized. And probably the most uh, important development is that coal facilities are generally declining as natural gas conversions are occurring. And certainly as natural gas conversions take place, there's less emphasis on legacy NSR being the focus of EPA. Uh, with respect to uh, on the, uh, the old form of uh, NSR, the, there are uh, three primary legal issues where we're getting clarification the statute of limitations in terms of failing to obtain that uh, new source review permit, the role of state implement implementation plans on enforcement, and something lawyers will like called the concurrent remedy doctrine, uh, and I'm only going to talk briefly about that. 
Uh, for those of the lawyers who enjoy reading cases, there's an excellent summary of all of this in the uh, case I have cited here on the slide. And uh, the judge uh, did, a, did a very good job of putting this forward and discussing all of these issues. With respect to the federal statute of limitations, uh, in the NSR world, we've always known the federal statute is five years. The issue has been, when does that statute start? Uh, a lot of these cases relate to events that occurred in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, they're historic and certainly greater than five years uh, had run before the government pursued enforcement. Federal circuit courts are pretty much lining up on this one to say that under the Federal Clean Air Act, it is a failure to obtain a permit. And the failure to obtain a permit is a one-time event. It's not continuing. And that's just the way the statute was written. Uh, we see two recent cases, Midwest Gen and the Homer City case. Uh, in both of those cases, the courts focused on the precise language of the Clean Air Act and said it refers to a permit. Permit is a one-time event, and uh, that's all you get with respect to the way the federal statute is worded. Uh, EPA and the environmental groups have been looking for alternative ways to deal with this particular issue and trying uh, as, as best they can on legal arguments to convert what is a failure to obtain a permit into a continuing operating violation. Because if it's a continuing operating violation, then they get the ability to pursue uh, a theory called continuing violations, and they can uh, say that the violation continues up to the current day, and therefore we get five years worth of penalties. Um, the approach has been, as I said, not successful under the wording of the Clean Air Act, so they've turned to what we call the SIP enforcement approach, or state implementation plan enforcement approach. Uh, most states have adopted their own regulations that incorporate a new source review program. These uh, requirements are made federally enforceable, and the language can vary from state to state as to what it says. Uh, because it's federally enforceable, that brings EPA into the picture, and that's why this is another theory that is being used. The uh, Sixth Circuit is the first one to address this with a case coming out of Tennessee. And basically, the theory here is that BACT is not a dictate on control equipment, but BACT is an emission limit. The SIP says facilities shall apply BACT, meaning they shall apply an emission limit. And the Tennessee uh, State Implementation Plan allowed you to go amend your permit and incorporate it after the fact permit requirements. And the court found in that case that there was a continuing violation of the state SIP requirements. Other states uh, have similar language, but we've had some circuit courts address Pennsylvania, South Dakota, and Alabama. And based on the wording of those particular state SIP provisions, uh, the courts have found that it was a one-time failure to apply back, just as it was a one-time failure to obtain a permit. And therefore, this avenue was foreclosed with respect to uh, uh, NSR in Pennsylvania, South Dakota, and Alabama. So we still have an open issue here. It is highly dependent on state language and the particular federal circuit court, which governs the state uh, where, the, where the issue arises. The other uh, aspect I wanted to talk about was called concurrent remedy. Uh, this is dealing with what's called injunctive relief. There's two types of relief you can get for NSR. One is penalties, meaning you pay money for the um, failure to or the violation. And the other is injunctive relief, meaning you put on controls to uh, bring yourself into compliance with law. Um, of course, the controls can be very expensive. So even though you don't pay a past penalty, if you have to put the controls on, it's important. The technical legal issue revolves around arcane law remedies for the, for the lawyers who took remedy law. Uh, you might remember the distinction between at law and equity. And uh, I'm not going to go into an explanation of that, but just want to point it out that that old remedies course does come into play. Um, the uh, most recent case discussing this is that United States Steel case I mentioned before out of the Northern District of Indiana. Uh, the basic lesson here is that with respect to the government, 
they can still get injunctive relief. And as you'll note, the quote from the case at the bottom, that the government must be allowed to bring violators into compliance with the law. So you may avoid, through statute of limitations, penalties, but then be caught dealing with the need to put on control equipment to address the injunctive relief. One of the other uh, little side issues that's been out there floating around and, and the government has not been successful on this is trying to really convert the uh, Clean Air Act into a Superfund program, if you will, meaning that liability goes back through prior ownership and sale transactions. And the, the issue is if you have an asset sale, um, not a stock sale, can the government uh, get to the current owner for the violations of the prior owner? Um, Courts have generally been hostile to this enforcement theory, and the recent Homer City case uh, uh, goes out of its way to uh, express uh, displeasure with that theory. Uh, there's a couple of lessons here. It's not necessarily a dead issue with respect to government enforcement. Um, penalties are certainly m more difficult to obtain. Uh, you've got to look at your... Um, your vulnerability with respect to injunctive relief, and if you purchase anything with an NSR question, do an asset sale uh, as a way to cut off the uh, historic problem. Uh, just briefly with respect to what I call new NSR, which is the uh, the actual to potential uh, actual or projected actual test. Um, you know, this requires use. If you read the rule carefully, and certainly the Obama administration is reading the rule carefully that was developed by the Bush administration in 2002. It does require uh, use of documented past actuals, projections that are based on business forecast, SEC financing statements, uh, a lot of in corporate information about what is going to happen with respect to the growth of the business. Um, there is recognition of growth accommodation, but there are limits and documentation required to that. So uh, it's something to watch what was actually written in the rule and the preamble explanation as opposed to shortcuts. Um, there was a recent case, uh, the DTT Energy case coming out of uh, the uh, Sixth Circuit, which does allow enforcement on this particular test and uh, does allow enforcement as to whether the actual to future actual projection is made pursuant to the requirements of the regulations. And we're seeing enforcement efforts going forward as to the appropriate baseline actuals, was the appropriate year used, what's the quality of the baseline data that was used in projections, was all relevant information used to make the projection, what was the documentation. Uh, another area of interest is the growth accommodation calculation and what I call the use of managing the emissions approach, which is where people say, uh, oh, it really doesn't matter what my projection is. I'm just going to project that I will always keep the emissions below the PSD uh, de minimis threshold. And that is one which is clearly a target of the Obama administration. Um, likely pitfalls here. Uh, well, I'll say the bottom one first. Shortcuts to simplify what's in the rule are likely enforcement traps. I, I've been to a lot of conferences, heard a lot of shortcuts being uh, put out by uh, uh, various people, and uh, those just are being looked at very carefully now. Uh, the, another couple of areas to look at are what, are what are the emission factors used in the baseline data? How accurate are those emission factors? How good are they in predicting what your baseline data is? And then making sure you use all the available projections and do a documentation to support that projection. Uh, I just have a final note for competitive businesses to watch your particular state because these projections are to be based on your uh, internal view of production increases and market demand. Competitors, I'm sure, would love that information. Uh, a state uh, that I'm very familiar with, uh, having um, lived here in Wisconsin and been involved in how the rule was put together, uh, here uh, we have an oddity that requires all of the information used in the projection, used in the calculation, to be provided to the general public upon request. And the confidentiality provisions, which typically, typically apply when you submit something to a state organization, um, are, are not referenced. So 
Uh, there may be other similar type uh, uh, provisions in other states with respect to the treatment of this information and something to be uh, careful about and to look at carefully. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian Potts, who's going to talk about the cross-state uh, air pollution rule and the developments on that, uh, that front. Brian? Thanks, Mark. Um, like Mark said, I'm going to talk about the cross-state rule U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, we've covered this case in detail on past webinars, both while the case was pending before the D.C. Circuit and uh, shortly after it was overturned. So I'll skip most of the background, but please note that all of those past webinars are available on our website if you want more detail about the rule. Uh, EPA's authority to adopt the cross-state rule, or CSAPR, or CASPR, or whatever you want to call it, is based on a simple section of the Clean Air Act called the Good Neighbor Provision. And that provision requires states to prohibit emissions that, quote, contribute significantly to non-attainment in or interfere with maintenance by any other state. And in other words, the cross-state rule is aimed at curbing the interstate transport of emissions. The rule had three programs, an SO2 program, an annual NOx program, and an ozone season NOx program. I use the term had because on uh, August 21st, 2012, the D.C. Circuit overturned the rule. Um, so the rule is not currently in effect. <clears throat> the court was divided two to one um, in overturning the rule. Uh, Judge Rogers wrote the dissent. And um, I'll get in, in a little bit um, more detail in, in what they held uh, in, a in a moment. Um, but uh, the as far as what Judge Rogers wrote in her dissent, but the majority um, held that EPA's method of setting the state budgets was unlawful. And basically, if you go back to the slide before and you see the, the Clean Air Act language, um, the problem was that EPA set the state budgets, the state allowance budgets, based on cost and how much it would cost to control the various um, plants uh, in the various states rather than how much the states were contributing to other states' air quality problems. And the majority held that that was unlawful um, and that EPA's method, that EPA had to consider cost when setting the state budgets. Um, the majority also held that EPA could not issue a FIP first. In other words, EPA had to give the states the ability to um, issue SIPs to implement the rule they couldn't just come out and, and basically dictate what the states were going to do. Um, so it was a, a pretty important decision. Um, the dissent basically s didn't really get into, in too much detail, either one of the issues, the, the um, setting of the state budgets or the fit first. There, the main focus of Judge Rogers' dissent was that uh, she argued that no one had raised these issues below um, during the rulemaking process. So the issues before the Supreme Court, uh, they, they granted cert on all of the issues. Um, so they're looking at the significant contribution issue and whether cost um, can be considered versus contribution um, in setting state, state reduction requirements. They're also going to look at the fit first issue and um, delve into the uh, specificity of comments during the, the rulemaking. Uh, the opening briefs have already been filed by EPA and the environmental groups. Uh, they're obviously more detailed than the D.C. Circuit briefs, but generally speaking, the arguments mirror, in the Supreme Court briefs, mirror the arguments from the D.C. Circuit. Uh, various amicus briefs have also been filed in support of EPA. I think there are seven or eight of them. Um, industry and state briefs are due on October 31st. The argument date was just released yesterday or the day before, and it's scheduled for December 10th, uh, which means we should expect a decision, I say spring of 2014. It could be a little bit earlier than that. Um, that's, it's pretty safe to assume by the spring of 2014 we'll have a decision. Uh, so assuming if EPA won, what does that mean? Um, I think realistically speaking, if EPA won on all issues, uh, the earliest they could probably implement the rule would be 2015 or, or even 2016. Um, and of course, if they, if they lose and the D.C. Circuit um, decision stands, 
uh, it'll be a little bit longer than that because they'll have to give states the um, ability to uh, <clears throat> to um, adopt SIPs, which takes at least a year. So what will a revised uh, cross-state rule look like? Actually, EPA, during this, um, uh, right before, I think, the Supreme Court granted cert or shortly after, EPA announced that it was going to uh, abide by the D.C. Circuit decision and release a new proposal in the spring of 2014. Um, and this actually will coincide with a greenhouse gas rule I'll talk about later for existing sources. Uh, but from a practical perspective, this means EPA has been and will be working on the rule um, during the Supreme Court case, uh, which I think means they have to be assuming they're going to lose the Supreme Court case while drafting that rule. Um, in other words, the rule will uh, be written based on the D.C. Circuit um, decision. We, I, I've, if you look at the data, um, the D.C. Circuit decision basically said that um, contribution of one state to another uh, was important and that the state requirements had to be based on contribution, including proportional contribution, et cetera. So um, if you look at the data in detail, I've given some examples of states that are likely to be hit harder by this rule and states that are likely to have more relaxed requirements than the, the cross-state rule that was overturned. Illinois and Indiana are likely to be hit harder because they have, um, relatively speaking, larger contributions to non-attainment in other states, whereas Texas, Iowa, and Wisconsin have pretty low contributions. With that, I will turn it uh, over to Dick to talk about the Boiler Mac, SISWI, and um, the non-hazardous secondary material rule. Okay, Brian. And, and one thing, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but just uh, in case anybody's not following the Casper stuff really in detail, and once you he heard from Brian that the D.C. Circuit threw out that rule two to one and it's been vacated, you should recall that there is another rule on the books right now that implements the good neighbor uh, provision. Uh, which is called CARE, the Clean Air, Clean Air Interstate Rule, C-A-I-R, uh, which ironically uh, the D.C. Circuit let stand, even though they found it was fundamentally flawed in many respects uh, under the Clean Air Act. So did I say that right, Brian? Yeah, you did. And in fact, I think CARE was adopted back in 2005, found to be unlawful a few years later, <laughs> and it's still in place because EPA hasn't been able to um, draft a rule that's made it through the courts. Okay. So here we go. Uh, we're, let's talk about some more rules that have had a rough sled uh, over the last few years, and a lot of people are interested in these rules. Uh, there's not a lot of substance to impart right now because the rules are out, and we've already covered these rules. Here, here they are right now. We've got the major source, uh, Boiler Nishap, area source, SISWI, and the non-hazardous secondary material rule under RICRA. Uh, we've covered these in detail. And please note, I think at the beginning of our slides and at the end of our slides, uh, there is a link where you can go to our website, and once you get to our website, you can get our earlier web conferences where we've covered the substance of these rules in some detail. Uh, I'm not going to do that now. I just want to give you an update on where these four rules are administratively and judicially, uh, because there are uh, developments, uh, again, nothing substantive too much, but more procedural at this point. Uh, remember all four of those rules actually were issued in March of 2011, but they were have, EPA had to rush those rules so horribly because of a court order deadline that the minute EPA issued them, they realized they, they were flawed, just like the D.C. Circuit said the Clean Air Interstate rule was, was flawed. That's still in effect, but EPA realized these rules were done in such a hurry and they were so flawed that they immediately announced a reconsideration of them and in a even delayed the effective date during the reconsideration. Now, if you followed our programs or if you follow this stuff very closely, you know then the district court in the District of Columbia ruled that EPA couldn't delay the effective date. So EPA had to do some fancy stuff with enforcement discretion. So for a while, those rules were all on the books, uh, but not being enforced because EPA issued enforcement discretion memos. At least now, these four rules are on the books now with the 2013 final rule issuances, and they have not been stayed. EPA has not stayed the effective date at all. So they're now on the books, and they're now enforceable. Uh, in fact, for the non-hazardous secondary material rule, for instance, there's lots of people coming in constantly if you go on EPA's website for that rule 
and getting so-called comfort letters. There's, there's lots of those out there already. So these, these rules are now being implemented. Now, of course, the, the rubber meets the road on the boiler rules in about three years, uh, and the rubber meets the road on SISWI in about five years, uh, unless you're a uh, new source. Uh, so we have administrative proceedings going on, and we had judicial. Uh, we had D.C. Circuit cases brought on the 2011 versions. They were all stayed or held in abeyance because everybody knew that EPA was going to issue amendments in 2013, as they did. So we now have the 2011 cases and the 2013 cases all consolidated together in the D.C. Circuit uh, under those case names. So th there you are for the major source, area sources, we and, and HSM. They're all uh, in uh, the D.C. Circuit now pending, and things are moving. Uh, but before we talk about how they're moving in the court, remember that the Clean Air Act has a special provision that's not in the Water Act or RICRA or, or in any other statutes. And that is, once EPA issues a final rule, if you have grounds to argue that you didn't have an adequate opportunity to comment on something that you were surprised or there, there was a deficiency in the notice, then you can file, in fact, not only you can file, but you should file, an administrative petition for reconsideration under Section 307 of the Clean Air Act. And parties do that regularly now, and parties have done this on the Boiler Mac two rules and SISWI. And again, not on non-hazardous secondary material because that's a RICRA rule, and there is no special provision in RICRA for, for such things. So we have, as, as we say here in the slide, uh, a lot of people filed uh, under the three Clean Air Act rules, administrative consideration, reconsideration petitions, and di EPA did announce on August 5th, uh, that they would reconsider certain issues in the three air rules. Now, this ties into the litigation because as the litigation moves forward now on these rules, at least the issues that EPA announced reconsideration on won't be litigated. They will be handled in an administrative process, which will take probably months, if not years. And then once EPA completes that administrative process on those issues, then there can be more D.C. Circuit litigation once there's a new final rule. So, um, again, you can get these slides from us. Uh, you, in fact, you're all going to get a copy of these slides by email next week, or you'll get, a, get at least a link, so, and you can download the slides. So I'm not going to cover these issues. Most of these issues that EPA granted reconsideration on are fairly technical anyway. They, they, they didn't, for at least for the boiler rules, none of the issues uh, that reconsideration has been granted on are, are terribly substantive. So I'm just, uh, there they are on the slide. You see there's more uh, issues being reconsidered on area source boiler. On SISWI, there's only two, but those are fairly significant for SISWI, particularly the PM limit for the waste burning kilns, for cement kilns. Uh, EPA is doing a reconsideration on that, and they're also doing some startup shutdown reconsideration. So I would say on SISWI, those are more important issues, uh, more substantive issues than the issues that are being reconsidered uh, for uh, the, the two boiler rules. Uh, so, and by the way, to add a little bit to the confusion, in the letters granting reconsideration, when EPA listed the issues that it was going to reconsider, it also had some follow-up language, which was pretty vague, saying, and they might look at some other issues, too. And, and, and frankly, we're trying to get EPA pinned down on that a little bit more these days because that can affect the litigation. If, if EPA really is going to look at an issue that they didn't specifically list and make it part of this new rulemaking process, then obviously that may be something that doesn't need to be litigated now in the D.C. Circuit. We are expecting to get a Federal Register notice any day now in which EPA actually sets forth a new uh, proposal for public comment based on the reconsideration in these three air rules. Uh, so now going back to the D.C. Circuit a minute, uh, as usual, there's a lot of confusion in the D.C. Circuit, particularly because you've got parties on all sides of these issues. You've got a lot of industry parties, you've got state parties, and you have environmental group parties. This is the typical drill for EPA rules. What's a little more unusual about this is that four rules are also closely tied together. Uh, and they, in fact, they are so closely tied together that the government, the EPA and, and Department of Justice, have moved and uh, have a motion pending right now that these four cases all be heard by the same panel uh, on the same day or days and that the briefing all be coordinated in some fashion so that all four cases will be briefed in somewhat of a slightly staggered fashion but pretty much on the same schedule. So all final briefs will be filed around the same time 
then all four cases would be heard by the same panel uh, of the D.C. Circuit. Uh, some parties have opposed that motion, and the court hasn't ruled on it yet. Uh, the, particularly people with, as I mentioned, the boilers have a three-year compliance deadline. CISWI has a five-year compliance deadline. A lot of the boiler interests are concerned about delays. Uh, they're, they're, they, they, they're afraid that if all four of these cases are so closely tied together, that can be nothing but delay. And if there's delay, that's going to start pinching a lot on what kind of decision you're going to get while the three-year compliance deadline is running. Remember, these rules are not stayed during judicial review, so the compliance deadlines are running right now. Uh, the, 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 uh, right now, it looks like I said in the second uh, item there, briefs fi probably filed by spring of 2014 based on some recent developments. I might say summer of 2014. I said final DC decision possible by end of 2014. I should have italicized possible because that's frankly looking a little less likely these days based upon the briefing proposals that the parties are, are going back and forth on. Uh, one thing to leave you on here before I turn it back to Brian, um, remember that an awful lot of the case law, uh, I'm sorry, an awful lot of the regulations that are coming out of EPA these days on, on these subjects, boilers and CISWI and non hazardous secondary material, a lot of these regulations are are coming out with, in part, dictated by D.C. Circuit decisions that the environmentalists have won. Uh, the, the, the Sierra Club and NRDC and parties like that have had a pretty good track record over the last few years under Clean Air Act 112 and Clean Air Act 129 in forcing EPA back into redoing rules. And um, so the, the thing to watch for here is that even though these rules are now final and we've got compliance deadlines running, the Sierra Club and, and parties like that have pending cases right now. They're, they're, they're challenging very fundamental aspects of the non-hazardous secondary material rule, for instance, and also the boiler and SISWI rules. And uh, with the good track record they've had, you've got to watch this, because if they get some significant victories out of the D.C. Circuit on this, there, there could be more going back to the drawing board. So the last point I'll make is, because I'm going to make this point again when we talk about some recent D.C. Circuit cases, and it also applies to the case Brian was talking about with, with Casper, sometimes it depends on who your panel is in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, if, if you get certain judges on the D.C. Circuit as your three-judge panel, uh, all of a sudden the Sierra Club and NRDC might have a much better chance of winning. Uh, if you get other judges, uh, then they might not. So, so it's all something to watch and um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, Brian now for some interesting discussion of what's going to happen and what we may hear about tomorrow morning. Yeah, thanks, Dick. Um, we uh, probably, had we known, we should have scheduled this uh, webinar next week so that we could talk about the rule that's going to be released tomorrow, but there have been lots of news reports about what that rule is going to look like, so um, I'm going to uh, make an educated guess as to what the rule is going to look like and then talk about that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to, uh, this uh, segment of the presentation is focused on um, the greenhouse gas power plant rules. Uh, President Obama released on Ju um, June 25th, 2013, his uh, climate action plan, and um, that received a lot of press. It's still receiving press. Uh, it includes a number of actions aimed at reducing greenhouse gases in the range of 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. Uh, regulation of power plants by EPA is the centerpiece of the plan because power plants account for uh, m more than a third of U.S. emissions. Uh, but the plan is broader than just power plants. It also in, uh, includes um, auto industry, cafe standards, um, renewable energy initiatives, and energy efficiency measures, um, along with a, a long list of other um, items that the administration is going to focus on. But I'm going to focus just on the power plant rules. Um, EPA has already proposed a new source performance standard for power plants. It did so back in April uh, of last year. Um, the executive order that was issued with Obama's climate action plan calls for EPA to repropose that new plant um, new source performance standard by tomorrow uh, and <clears throat> finalize that new plant rule as expeditiously as possible and then also propose a new source performance standards for existing plants by the spring of 2014 
and finalize the existing plant um, in SPS by 2015. <clears throat> so EPA's first NSPS proposal, which was uh, released la last April, talk about that for just a second. Um, EPA is ba basically trying to set um, a standard of performance, and that's a defined term in the Clean Air Act, for power plants under Clean Air Act Section 111. And the definition is important. Standard of performance is defined as a standard for emissions, which reflects the degree of emissions limitation achievable through the application of the best system of emission reduction, which, taking into account cost, the administrator determines has been adequately demonstrated. Um, and, you know, the way this has historically worked is the new source performance standards, uh, that part of the Clean Air Act was um, actually put in the Clean Air Act in 1970. And um, another part of the Clean Air Act was added later, the PSD provisions in 78. So uh, historically what has happened is NSPS have been the floor um, standards for uh, all the sources in whatever category EPA is regulating. <clears throat> and then um, the PSD provisions, as you modify your plants, your, you go get a permit and you have to do a backed or layered determination, another technology uh, determination, and that's supposed to be more stringent than the, or, or as stringent as the floor standard, as the NSPS standard. Um, so in this first NSPS proposal, EPA combined coal and natural gas plants into one category. And basically what e EPA did was it determined that the best technology available for a coal-fired, for a new coal-fired power plant was to be a natural gas-fired power plant, which sounds odd and from a legal perspective was on very shaky grounds. Uh, they set the standard at a level achieved by a combined cycle gas plant. So again, basically EPA said in the original proposal back, April, back in April that um, you, that all new power plants had to meet a level that only combined cycle gas plants could meet, which is, um, for all practical purposes was a ban on new um, coal-fired power plants. So there were various legal problems with that proposal that were raised by industry in um, literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of comments uh, raised on the rule. Um, the, uh, the main ones are that historically, you know, EPA set a lot of new source performance standards in the past and done a lot of backed determinations and technology determinations. And the case law and EPA's past decisions have always said you can't, when you're doing this, setting a technology standard, you can't redefine the source or the project. And courts have said you can't require fuel switching. And so obviously the problem with EPA's first proposal and frankly, um, if, if the press reports are right, the problem with their new proposal is that, that what, that's really what they're doing. They're redefining the source and requiring gas plants and or requiring fuel switching. Um, so <clears throat> putting the two source categories together, I think, um, was EPA's biggest legal worry with the original proposal. Um, and so they've, they've obviously decided to re-propose the rule. So I guess they're going to scrap the April rule and issue a totally new proposal tomorrow. Gina McCarthy's announcement is at 9 a.m. at the National Press Club. They will be, according to press reports, splitting up the coal and gas plants and setting two different standards, one for coal plants and one for gas plants. Uh, the um, Late last week, various reports, including New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, have reported that e EPA's new rule will set the new plant gas or uh, coal standard at about 1,400 pounds per megawatt hour, and the gas standard at about 1,000. So, from a practical perspective, what that means is for a new coal plant, a the most efficient coal plant um, on the market is will probably get you around 1,900 pounds per megawatt hour. So EPA has basically set the standard at a level that would require um, a new coal-fired power plant to install caption, or carbon capture and, and uh, storage technology, CCS. <clears throat> uh, and I'll, I'll talk in the next slide, um, or in a, in a couple slides, about some of the legal problems with that. Uh, 
So the existing plant in SPS is in that is is supposed to be proposed in 2014 and come out in 2015. It's based on a different section of Section 111. It's 111D. Um, it's a rarely used section. EPA has actually only set five NSPS standards ever using this section of the Clean Air Act. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is it's still based on the same standard of performance language. In other words, the technology that they choose needs to be adequately demonstrated and they have to consider the cost of the technology. And so all of that case law that I talked about before and, and EPA's past determinations with regards to redefining the source, requiring fuel switching, et cetera, that all um, would apply also to the existing plant NSPS. And um, the, the language in 111D, which I think is important, it says each state shall submit a plan which establishes standards of performance for any existing source which is not emitted from a source category which is regulated under Section 112. Section 112 is the hazardous air pollutant program. Um, and so there have been uh, legal questions raised as to whether EPA could even regulate uh, power plants under Section 111D because they are a source category that's regulated under Section 112. Um, there are disputes about that. Uh, various papers and organizations have uh, studied this. There's uh, the legislative history on, on Section 111 is sort of, I would say, split. Um, so that that issue will almost certainly be raised in court. So, so there's a lot of legal questions about, e, you know, what EPA can um, can and can't do with these uh, two rules. Um, as I said, EPA, if if the press reports are right, the proposal tomorrow will essentially ban new coal-fired power plants because CCS is so expensive. Um, the only um, large-scale installation of CCS on a coal plant in this country that I'm aware of is the one that Southern Company is building right now. I think it's about 75 percent complete. The cost is around five billion, um, which puts it in line with um, as expensive as a nuclear plant. Um, and <clears throat> so the question is, you know, is CCS adequately demonstrated and cost effective and, and is a court going to agree with EPA? that it is, given that there's no large-scale use of CCS um, in the country. And EPA's made a bunch of past statements in the April 2012 rule about the cost of CCS, basically saying it would add 80 percent to the cost of electricity coming out of a new plant, which is obviously a uh, very um, high figure. Another thing um, to consider on the legal front is EPA is set back to technology standards for a number of um, existing and new coal plants, and those have basically just required energy efficiency measures in the range of about a 1 to 5 percent reduction. And the Clean Air Act says that BACT is supposed to be more stringent than the NSPS standards. So if EPA is going to require CCS, which is, you know, a 30 to 40 percent reduction from a, um, a new coal-fired power plant, yet it's already set up uh, or agreed to a number of back determinations in the past that were in the 1 to 5 percent range, I think that's going to uh, um, could come back to bite them when this inevitably ends up in court. Um, on the whole, I'd say the proposal, if it does, if it, if it does set the standard at 1,400, is going to be on pretty legal uh, or pretty shaky legal ground. And then the existing plan, NSPS, there's been a lot written about whether or not EPA can allow trading. Um, including offsets. Obviously, the language is silent on that point. M I'd say most legal um, scholars agree that they could allow trading. But then again, there's the question of whether they can regulate power plants given the, um, the fact that they are already regulated under Section 112. And then the same backed issues that, that EPA has agreed to a number of backed determinations for existing coal-fired power plants that have been in the range of 1 to 5 percent uh, reduction. So with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Dick. Uh, thanks, Brian. And, and by the way, if you go to our website and you go to Brian's uh, bio, you can Google and, and get some uh, good articles that Brian's written recently about some of the legal problems he's talking about, um, which have gotten quite a bit of play, actually, out in the, out in the world. Uh, 
remember now, you know, Mark has talked about several different circuits ruling on the Clean Air Act recently, but when it comes to judicial review of EPA's rules under the Clean Air Act, that's exclusive D.C. Circuit. So the D.C. Circuit is clearly the one to watch here when you're talking about EPA's rulemakings and so forth. Um, I mentioned, it was just, we're just going to talk, about, we don't have much time, just a few recent fairly significant D.C. Circuit cases since the last time we did a web conference. Um, I mentioned earlier how NRDC and Sierra Club have done so well over the years in the D.C. Circuit uh, challenging EPA's interpretations under Section 112 and 129. And I mentioned this Brickmac case here in the second item. Uh, that, that's a case that causes industry much grief and has caused industry much grief over the years, that, that good old Brickmac case and the way EPA has to go about setting standards under 112. But they don't always win. CR Club and NRDC don't always win. And there's been a couple of cases recently where on a couple of fairly significant issues under 112 and the, that crosses over to Section 129, says we, uh, they have lost. And both of them involve the degree to which uh, EPA can consider costs. Uh, if you go to the May 29th decision, Association of Battery Recyclers, um, uh, Sierra Club had, I mean, I'm sorry, CIA. Yeah, I think Sierra had argued uh, in that case, they were a party, the Association of Battery Recyclers filed first. So that's why it's called Association of uh, Battery Recyclers. And as usual, almost all these DC Circuit cases, remember, you've got a bunch of industry parties and you've got environmental groups there in the same case arguing against each other with EPA in the middle. Um, so here in this case, uh, the DC Circuit rejected a Sierra position uh, that uh, and, and said that costs can be considered when EPA does a review each eight years of the MAC standards that it set before. Now, we, everybody realizes when they first, when EPA sets that first floor for existing sources in the top 12 percent, the best 12 percent, that is, everybody argue, everybody realizes that's regardless of cost. But then the question comes up, well, when they reconsider those standards every eight years as they have to do, uh, then can they consider costs? And, and the Sierra Club said no, the D.C. Circuit said yes, and the D.C. Circuit also reminded uh, us uh, by citing this 2008 case, uh, the, the NRDC case, which NRDC lost on this issue, that as you redo MAC standards with, on the top 12 percent, as you redo them in the future, you don't have to go down and take the 12 percent again. In other words, you don't have to do what's called MAC on MAC. You do the 12 percent once, and that's that. Um, now, uh, another case that, that um, recently the Sierra Club lost on uh, involves Section 129, which I think for all practical purposes is just like 112 when it comes to standard setting. And sec here uh, the uh, Sierra Club argued that when EPA is going to consider whether they go beyond the floor, that is, you know, go beyond that top 12% and maybe consider going even more stringent. Um, even though the statute at that point says consider costs, the statute doesn't say cost effectiveness. Uh, Sierra Club argued that EPA, because they considered cost effectiveness, had somehow violated the statute, and the D.C. Circuit disagreed. So EPA can consider cost effectiveness under Section 129. That's the holding of this case, this August 20th case. Um, Sierra Club is actually arguing the same point in a case involving the cement industry that's going to be argued in the D.C. Circuit on Oct October 24th of this year. And uh, I think both EPA and the industry have filed letters with the court saying that whatever the rule is under 129 has to be the same under 112. Uh, the Sierra Club obviously has filed a letter with the D.C. Circuit uh, in preparation for this October argument disagree. So we'll see how that goes uh, and watch watch for the decision uh, on the case that's going to be argued October 24th, um, which is a, another, another Sierra Club case that involves the most recent Portland cement NESHAP standards. Um, I want to just briefly report on July 2013, uh, there were three cases in the D.C. Circuit that month that industry lost significant issues on. Uh, Center for Biological Diversity had to do with the ethanol uh, requirements where, where EPA was trying to defer for three years 
uh, any kind of PSD review for greenhouse gases for a particular type of source, inclu you know, including ethanol type sources. And the DC Circuit ruled two to one that EPA hadn't actually explained itself well enough. And so um, it vacated EPA's deferral. Now, this is a, a sort of a strange procedural posture because the court's mandate has not issued yet on that. And the court's mandate is going to depend perhaps on whether the, the uh, Supreme Court grants certiorari on some other greenhouse gas cases that the DC Circuit uh, had uh, decided recently. So but if the mandate issues, then there's going to be a lot of confusion for those who have to worry about uh, these rules, because all of a sudden, the PSD re regulations for greenhouse gas are going to apply to those sources who thought they were exempt for three years. Um, another case that uh, industry lost, and in this one, by the way, Sierra Club lost also, or at least mostly this. Again, industry comes in on one side, Sierra Club comes in on the other side, puts EPA in the middle. On this one, the, the court basically upheld EPA against both industry and Sierra, except for the secondary standard, as you see there in my, in my second uh, item. But they, what the court did here was uphold the 2008 primary air quality standard, primary air quality standard for ozone. Now, there's going to be plenty more, as I note here at the end of the page, plenty more coming on ozone. Because you may recall that EPA was poised to come out with new ozone standards in 2011, and the administrator very much wanted to do so, but was overruled by the White House, and uh, that was widely reported in the press. So EPA has sort of held off on developing new ozone standards, but they're now being sued in, in Northern District of California to get on a deadline because they are beyond the five years. You know, Clean Air Act requires review and revi revise as necessary every five years, every one of those ambient air standards. And the environmental groups have really caught on to that, and they're getting much more aggressive about suing EPA for missing these deadlines for the ambient air quality standards. So we're going to have that game played again soon where there's going to be probably some kind of settlement agreement where EPA is going to be on a new court order deadline to do a new ambient air standard for ozone in the near future. Finally, uh, state of Texas versus EPA is another case that EPA lost. Uh, I'm sorry, the EPA won, industry lost. <laughs> industry lost on this one in the greenhouse gas context where after EPA won the issue on the tailoring rule, they, they successfully fended off challenges to their tailoring rule for PSD based on standing. Uh, EPA then was going out and, and amending state implementation plans to provide for greenhouse gas review under the PSD regs, and they were slapping those regs into state plans where the states were refusing to do anything. Uh, industry and the states, including the state of Texas, challenged EPA's right to do that. Um, in, in this case, they lost. The, the D.C. Circuit said, no, uh, PSD review is directly applicable by virtue of the statute. Uh, therefore, that you have no grounds to challenge that on. EPA can slap those regs in the way they did. Uh, and I note here in my last point uh, is, is, again, if you read this opinion and you see you see Judge Rogers writing the majority opinion and Judge Kavanaugh writing a very strong dissent, and then you go back to the case that Brian was talking about earlier on Casper, where you saw Judge Kavanaugh writing the majority opinion and Judge Rogers writing a very strong dissent. And it sort of shows once again, which I think most people who, who do D.C. Circuit stuff, re, you know, just everybody just sort of realizes and recognizes this now. When you have a case before the D.C. Circuit now, it sure depends on who your panel is. Because if you get certain judges, you can pretty well predict that they're going to go with EPA or in the environmentalists, and you get other judges, and they're more likely to uh, at least give respect to industry-type arguments. And Jen, are we ready for questions, or do we have time? Yeah. Uh, be before we go into the Q&A section, I just want to make a brief CLE announcement. Those seeking Kansas, New Jersey, or New York CLE credit are required to use the following four-digit code to complete the attorney affirmation form. The code is FE7W. That's F as in Frank, E as in Edward, the number 7, and W as in Walter. To obtain a copy of the attorney affirmation form, download it from the files box at the right-hand side of your screen or email Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at foley.com. 
Once again, the code for attorney affirmation is FE7W. That's F is in Frank, E is in Edward, the number 7, W is in Walter. This code is only needed for those seeking CLE in Kansas, New Jersey, or New York. This concludes our CLE announcement. And we'll turn over to the question and answer portion. Uh, we do not have any questions in the online queue. Do you want to uh, open it up for live questions at this time? Thank you. To ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Also, if you are using a speakerphone, please make sure that your mute button is turned on. Posing your question. Once again, star 1 on the phone lines for questions. And there are no questions in the queue at this time. As a reminder, star 1 on the phone lines. I think we will then uh, turn to the wrap-up since uh, we're not getting any questions. We would like to thank everybody for um, joining us today. Uh, just a reminder, today's program is recorded and will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. If you have questions regarding CLE for this program, please contact me, Jennifer Bartz, at jbartz at foley.com. Finally, please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation. It's important for us to know your thoughts, and help, it helps us shape our programs going forward. Thank you again, and this concludes our program. And once again, that does conclude today's conference. We'd like to thank everyone for their participation. <laughs>